Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Everyone is secretly moving here. Where is here? I've got a surprising answer on where everyone is moving, and it's a place that you haven't heard about from any other source, and this is really going to surprise you. Then, are you better off renting the home that you live in or owning the home that you live in? More rent versus own pros and cons than you ever would have imagined, including a lot of considerations that you probably never thought about before, all today on episode 432 of the Get Rich Education Podcast. Mid-South Home Buyers, with over two decades as the nation's highest rated turnkey provider, their empathetic property managers use your return on investment as their North Star. It's no wonder smart investors line up to get their completely renovated income properties like it's the newest iPhone. Headquartered in Memphis with their globally attractive cash flows, Mid-South has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and 4,000 houses renovated. There is zero markup on maintenance, let that sink in, and they average a 98.9% occupancy rate with an industry-leading three-and-a-half-year average renter term. Every home they offer you will have brand new components, a bumper-to-bumper one-year warranty, new 30-year roofs, and wait for it, a high-quality renter in an astounding price range, 100 to 150 k Get to know Mid-South. Enjoy cash flow from day one at MidSouthHomeBuyers.com. That's MidSouthHomeBuyers.com. GRE listeners can't stop talking about their service from Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided our tribe with more loans than anyone. They're truly a top lender for beginners and veterans. It's where I go to get my own loans for single-family rental property up to fourplexes. So start your pre-qualification and you can chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. They'll even deliver your custom plan for growing your real estate portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Kennesaw, Georgia to Waukesha, Wisconsin and across 188 nations worldwide. You're listening to the show that's created more durable financial freedom for busy people just like you than nearly any show in the world. With more than 4.5 million listener downloads, I'm grateful and frankly pretty flattered by this point (laughs) by your devoted listenership. My name is Keith Weinhold, 20-year real estate investor and active member of the Forbes Real Estate Council here where I am based in the United States. Where is everyone moving? There is a giant piece to population shifts and everyone, I mean virtually absolutely everyone, is missing this and you probably never before heard in your entire life what I'm about to share with you. I don't hear real estate people talk about this. I don't hear demographers or geographers or market economists and analysts talk about this. Some just simply don't know this. Now, I've discussed migration to certain states and cities before here, actually fairly frequently on the show. You know, we talk about places that are in migration hotbeds like Florida and Nashville and perhaps Raleigh, North Carolina and other in-migration hotbeds in Tennessee and parts of Ohio. And for a while, late in the pandemic, a lot of Californians were moving to Idaho. For example, geopolitical Peter Zion. Each time he's here on the show with me, we discuss those particular topics at length. But I've never discussed what I will share with you today because it is just on a completely different plane than all of that. There is a substantial migration trend that you probably don't know about, and it's been taking place for decades, decade after decade. It's likely going on right now in your home nation, even if you live outside the United States, but we're typically talking about the United States here today. This unlikely migration trend is happening in your state. It's happening in your county and in your town, and probably even the block that you live on, it's almost like a secret. Well, where is everyone moving? The answer is absolutely and exactly nowhere. Yeah, it's nowhere. Let me tell you and show you exactly what I'm talking about. It's the big population trend 
that no one discusses. Now, if you're a reader of our Don't Quit Your Daydream newsletter, you're already somewhat clued in on this because I shared it with you recently and I shared a migration chart with you there. And you might already know that you can get our wealth building newsletter free by texting GRE to 66866. But if you don't want to build wealth for yourself in the future, then you wouldn't have any interest in my letter. <laughs> but if you do, text GRE to 66866, and that's all it takes. You are in. Everyone is moving there. You hear that sometimes, and you can replace the word there with some of those places that I mentioned, or like Tampa or Boise. No, not really everyone. Real estate investors, we pay attention to migration patterns and despite the popular pandemic narrative, most people don't realize that fewer and fewer people are moving at all. And it's an even bigger trend than you think. Yes, so a long-term erosion in the migration rate that has been taking place since at least the 1940s. Yeah, decade after decade since the 1940s. And this information that I'm citing is sourced by the United States Census Bureau surveys. This migration rate, which in some studies you'll see, it's also referred to as the mobility rate. It means the same thing, migration rate, mobility rate, interchangeably. What this is measuring is the percentage of America's population that has moved each year. And that rate is just nose diving down, down, down. And to be clear, we're talking about domestic migration here. No immigration to the U.S. is factored in here. America is becoming less and less mobile. Back in the 1940s and 1950s, the rate was 20%. All right, so that means that each year, 20% of Americans moved. That was quite a bit. One in five people move every year. But it's been declining ever since. It has moved from 20% to 18% over the decades, to 16, to 14, to 12. It's a trend that really picked up steam in the early 1980s, this trend of more and more people staying in place. In fact, by 2017, the mobility rate had plummeted to just 10%. And again, what that number represents is the proportion of the American population that moves each year. More and more people are staying in place. And now these past five years, that has picked up even more speed. You have even more people staying in place. The 2022 number is not in yet, but we've got a good chunk of even the health crisis era migration factored in here because from 2020 to 2021, only 8.4 people moved each year. Yeah, so it is down to just 8.4%. That is the latest accurate figure that we have for the American migration rate, and that is based on Census Bureau data. Now, we'll look at the reasons behind this fascinating trend shortly, but since the Census Bureau began collecting migration statistics in 1947, today's migration rate is at a low. So really then, it is at an all time low for recorded American history. Now, this gets more interesting. Let's look at what in the heck is going on here. <laughs> this is why I say increasingly that America is moving nowhere. I think that a lot of people just seem to have this feeling or belief that mobility is on the increase, but this tells us that it's not and that this is nothing new either, but it's just something that no one seems to notice. Hey, but what do you think? With Buffalo, New York getting all these four-foot snowfalls, will that itself push up the migration rate when everyone moves out of there? <laughs> now, it is both short and long-distance moves that are falling. The most reluctant demographic to move is families with children. All right, that makes sense. Now, before we look at why almost shockingly few people move anymore, let's look at the top reasons for moving. Okay, among those people that do decide to move, which is a group that keeps shrinking. And now this here, it might be another surprise to you. When it comes to the top reasons for moving, it's usually not about a job. And again, with data sourced from the Census Bureau, when it comes to the top reasons for moving, this shrinking group of people that decide to do that, 
46% of moves are housing related. Yeah, 46%. That is the big chunk. Housing related with this persistent undersupply of American homes, which by the way, it puts a foundation on home prices. Well, when people have a chance to go ahead and get matched up with a housing type that is right for them when something actually comes open since supply is so low, well, that spurs a move more than any other reason. And it really makes sense when you think about it that way. All right, so 46% of moves are housing related. That is the number one reason for moving. The next is 25% of moves are family related. 15% of moves are for employment related reasons, those jobs, and then 14% cited other reasons. All right, so housing is the number one reason for moving. It's not jobs. All right, well, let's dig in on this curious trend. What is really going on here? Why are Americans moving less? What's the reason behind what appears to be the best kept secret about migration patterns, something really important in the real estate world? Well, the first reason that more people are staying in place is that our population is aging. Older people are less mobile. And when the migration rate was 20% plus in the 1940s and 50s, and again, that would mean one in five people moved each year. Well, America was younger back then, 70, 80 years ago in the 1940s and 50s. The second reason for people staying in place is millennials. They are the largest generation in American history. So follow their trend. Millennials got financially crunched in both the 2008 Great Recession and 2021's health crisis led housing frenzy. And millennials are still having trouble forming their own household, which kills mobility. They are living at home with their parents later and later and postponing marriage and childbearing. Well, staying at home with your parents, that means that you are what? Not moving. And that particular phenomenon is also my guess as to a reason why the plummeting mobility rate has just accelerated in recent years here. And another reason here, the third reason now, is that there are more dual earner households than there were decades ago. Well, that makes people less footloose. So to review, the three big reasons why more Americans are staying in place is that America is older because of trends with millennials and the fact that there are more dual earner households. And as for the future, what do I think that the mobility rate will do? Well, the trend's going to continue. It's going to fall even further. And why is that? Because in the past two years, housing has become less affordable to either own or to rent. And that makes it harder to move out and get your own place and harder to be mobile. Another reason that the mobility rate is poised to fall further in the near term, in my opinion, is that mortgage interest rates are higher. So if an existing homeowner sells and moves, they'd have to give up their low mortgage rate that they locked in these past few years if they sell that home, and then they'd have to go replace it with a higher mortgage rate. So this interest rate lock-in effect keeps more residents in place. Well, all right, you might find this interesting and enlightening, but what does that really mean to you? What can you do with this knowledge? So let me share some of the effects of this decreased migration rate with you in just a moment. But first, the bottom line so far today on the show, to review everything that you've learned so far is that America's mobility rate is decreasing, moves are usually not employment related, they are housing related, and that more people are being kept in place for economic, demographic, and cultural reasons. Now that you know about decreased mobility and the reasons why, how can you interpret this into projecting future trends and what's going to occur with real estate? Both trends, positive trends and negative trends. On the positive side, this can actually lead to a less stressed society. Moving is one of the most stressful things you can possibly do. It's extremely disruptive. It upends almost your entire life. Suddenly you're living in this weird world of cardboard boxes for weeks and you're having dinner from 7-Eleven five nights in a row. <laughs> you are getting roughed up. So don't underestimate how hard moving is yourself. 
Another positive, although we don't have this information parsed between renters and homeowners, is that for real estate investors, tenants could very well be living at your property longer. Well, that's really good for investment property investors since vacancy and turnover, they are your greatest expense. Though I don't really believe that this is some groundbreaking profit center for you, it's a pretty minor diffuse and long-term effect. Residents of all types staying in place is also good for the remodeling world and all of the home remodeling related industries. And this is also good for families. Of course, families bond strengthen when fewer people move away. And this is also good for community formation. Neighbors can get to know each other if they're, well, neighbors long enough. And residents want to do things like volunteer and contribute to a community more if they feel like they are rooted there. Now, let's look at some negative consequences of lower and lower mobility, this lower migration, fewer furniture purchases, and all of those purchases that accompany a new home buy. And those sorts of things really drive so many sectors of the economy. Low mobility is really bad, not a growth trend in any way for real estate agents, and it's not good for mortgage companies. I tell you things here on GRE that you often wouldn't expect to learn about building your wealth through real estate and all of its adjacent factors. This is probably the first show where you learned that you actually want to lock up millions of dollars in debt rather than contribute to a 401k. This is perhaps the first place you learned that the return from home equity is always zero. So go ahead and tie up more properties with debt. We're talking about the things that you won't hear about anywhere else and they really affect you. If you have a comment or even a concern about this show or a question, you can leave either a voicemail here or a text-based message on our contact page at getricheducation.com slash contact. We love hearing from you. And it's kind of funny, like, of course I tell you things that you wouldn't expect to hear. If I only shared with you what you expected to hear, that would be pretty boring for both you and I, and then there wouldn't even be any reason for me to be here with you. So there's little value in you hearing only what you expect to hear. I am joining you from Metro Las Vegas, Nevada all month from Henderson to be specific while I have some family that's in need here. And when I sought housing with an area for a temporary GRE studio here, do you know what housing arrangement that I wanted personally? <laughs> You might not believe this. You're going to learn something funky about me here. Now, real estate investors like you, you are going to make more income than others if you take action and you own property. And, you know, some people, therefore, that do this, you know, they get these visions where you might have a dream car in mind that you want, or you might have it be a goal that you build so much residual income that you can afford your own private plane. And there's nothing wrong with those things at all. But do you know what one of my dreams is? A dream that I've had for actually decades now. And it has to do with my housing here in this area. It's none of those dreamy status symbols. It is, <laughs> am I really going to share this with you? To live in an apartment above a gym. <laughs> now, I thought that spending a month or more here, it might be the right scenario to finally find an apartment and rent it and have it be above a gym because I like to exercise, but I couldn't find that scenario. <laughs> I couldn't find that Airbnb listing, probably because of the world's 8 billion inhabitants, I'm the only person that would value and seek out such a thing. <laughs> so no apartment above a gym, but I have utilized the area's paved trails for outdoor running. Yeah, fitness is a real priority in my life. If you listen to this show, you're going to be just fine financially over time. But no matter your financial condition, you're going to be living inside that same body of yours decade after decade after decade. That is one thing that you can be sure of. So take care of it. I don't discuss fitness on this show very much, nor do I plan to. This is a real estate show. If you want to follow that side of me, my Instagram handle is pretty easy to remember because it's simply at Keith Weinhold. So again, if you'd like to see more about my fitness and some travel, my Instagram is at Keith Weinhold. 
Should you rent the home that you live in, or are you better off owning it? That's next. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. If you're looking to grow your passive income from real estate, pay attention. My Property Stats is a deal analysis tool developed by an active investor to cut the time it takes to analyze any deal by over 90%. For any real estate class, you can calculate the exact price to pay to hit your cash flow and IRR goals. Build a world-class pro forma. Calculate the most you should pay for a renovation. Run multiple scenarios with a comparison tool and more. My Property Stats is the all-in-one toolkit for real estate investors. That means more deals, more cash flow, and more returns. Go to mypropertystats.com slash GRE now and use the coupon code GRE to get 10% off your first year. That's just $90 a year for a tool that can save 10 hours per deal. No more spreadsheets, no more juggling multiple files. Use coupon code GRE to get 10% off at mypropertystats.com slash GRE. When you want the best real estate and finance info, the modern internet experience limits your free articles access and it's replete with paywalls and you get pop-ups and push notifications and cookies disclaimers. Ugh. At no other time in history has it been more vital to place nice, clean, free content in your hands that actually adds no hype value to your life. That's why this is the golden age of quality newsletters, and I rate ours myself. It's got a dash of humor, and it is to the point. To get it, it couldn't be more simple. Just type up a text message with the letters G-R-E in the body and send it to the phone number 66866. And when you start the free newsletter, you'll also get my one-hour fast real estate course completely free. Subscribe to my Don't Quit Your Daydream newsletter and your mind will be wired for wealth. Text GRE to 66866. Text GRE to 66866. This is Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. Welcome back to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Join me for tomorrow night's live event where you'll learn about the profitable real estate model of car washes. It is super interesting, really lucrative, and there's no guarantee, but you might even be able to get involved. The sponsor and I will be live and you can ask us questions in real time. Register right now at grewebinars.com. That's grewebinars.com. Most Americans couldn't afford to buy their own home today. Isn't that a remarkable concept? Yeah, that is due to higher prices and mortgage rates. And that was as of a month or two ago that that statement was true. I suspect that it still is, but mortgage rates have come down. In fact, the mortgage rate might soon begin with the number five again. But there's some sort of imputation or insinuation there that it is somehow better for you to own your home than it is for you to rent it, well, that is not necessarily true. Now, it's still a few months until the spring home buying season gets underway, but oftentimes decisions about whether to rent or own, they get made now. So that's why I'm highlighting this today. To be clear, we often talk about how income property, rental property, has made more ordinary people wealthy than anything else on this show. That is not what we're talking about on this segment. Join us here next week for our beginner's real estate investing guide. That's on the investment side. We're going to be talking about homes that are income properties that you plan to rent to others and don't live in. That is next week's show, the beginner's guide to real estate investing. And hey, go ahead and tell a friend about the show. They might really like today's rent versus own material in next week's beginner's guide to real estate investing right here on the Get Rich Education Podcast. But today, we're talking about whether you're better off renting or owning your primary residence. And you're going to learn some things that you've never thought about before. So we're going to have 18, yeah, 18 considerations, some real surprises in this rent versus own, really like a conflict. And these 18 fact-based points should really be your ultimate resource 
in making one of the biggest financial decisions of your entire life. Trade-offs to help you consider which way you're better off. And look, I'm not an agent. I'm not a realtor that makes a commission from selling you a primary residence. So you can settle in and relax for some unbiased information that you've never heard before. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with agents that make commissions. In fact, a good agent can simplify your life and bring you a lot of expertise and be worth their commission because maybe you'll get a higher sale price for that. I'm just letting you know that I don't have that particular interest here. And before we get into these 18 trade-offs, let's acknowledge something that I haven't discussed in quite a long time and I am quite anchored in on this point. Paying rent is not the same as throwing money away. And yeah, I know that that's not a popular opinion, but we're going to look at why this is the unpopular truth. Most people think that owning a home is a financial asset. That is not quite true either. In fact, the top-selling financial author of all time, Robert Kiyosaki, someone that's been here on the Jerry podcast with us four times, he says a home is a liability, not an asset. And that's because an asset puts money into your pocket every month and a home takes money out of your pocket every month. All right, well, in strict financial analysis, a home is an asset, though. That's going to be on the asset side of your net worth column, and the debt is going to be over there on the liability side, the mortgage debt. But Kiyosaki is right in that a primary residence is a cash flow drain for you. All right, sure, that can be true. But is renting an even bigger cash flow drain for you? All right, that's part of what you're going to learn here. Now, you've certainly heard before that paying rent is like throwing money away because at the end of the month, what do you have to show for it? I strongly disagree with that sentiment. Look, the last time that you flew, you might have spent $850 to quote unquote rent an airplane seat for six hours. But after that, you didn't lament about throwing that money away. Because see, you enjoy the benefit of using each item, a home for you to live in, and an airplane seat for your travel. Yeah, the airplane seat, that gives you the experience of enjoying New York City and Times Square, or Yellowstone Park, or visiting your family in Connecticut. Although neither the home nor the airplane seat provide a tangible financial return, you got an experiential return. You got a return on life. So although owning a home is really a good strict financial investment, though it could be if you buy and sell at just the right time in a fast appreciating market, well, you tie up an awful lot of money in your humble abode. So let's explore this. 18 big factors, rent versus own. It makes sense to rent more often than a lot of people think. In fact, more people are renting. The current U.S. homeownership rate is 66%. That is down from 69%. 69%, that was the recent peak about 20 years ago, back in 2004. As you take a look at the history of the American homeownership rate, understand that I expect the homeownership rate to fall over the next year or so, and of course, that's because of the cost of homeownership has soared in recent years. More Americans have been taken out of that homebuyer pool and added to the renter pool. That's probably going to continue a little longer. So here we go. The first of the 18 factors in your rent versus own decision, many of which you've never thought about before, is time. Do you really want to spend any of your evenings or weekends at Home Depot and Lowe's or your evenings online researching how to fix garage doors or fixing leaky faucets with pliers. Well, homeowners are going to do that. And it's not just fixer upper type homes. See, for you to avoid feeling like you're living in a dated home, you might need to upgrade your kitchens and your bathrooms every 15 years. Now, it's possible that you'll enjoy doing those things depending on how you're geared. But whether you enjoy it or not, it is how you are spending your one finite, irreplaceable resource of time in this one life on earth that you have. The second of 18 rent versus own considerations is choice. There are more homes for sale than there are rentals, especially at the higher end. So you'll have more choice in buying a home than renting a home. 
But this, like all things real estate, it's going to vary by your chosen geographic market. And more homes being used as short-term rentals like Airbnbs and VRBOs, that makes the pool of both sales and long-term rentals shrink. The third consideration is equity buildup. All right, this is going to be a real paradigm shift for you if you're new here and the initiated, you already get this. Equity is the difference between what your home is worth and how much you owe on the mortgage loan. Homeowners build equity and renters do not. All right, that's something that matters. But for homeowners, you got to understand that home equity is an awful investment. Equity has zero rate of return because the presence or absence of equity in your home has nothing to do with whether or not your home appreciates. And additionally, most of your mortgage payment goes toward interest, not principal. Your interest payment alone could be higher than a rent payment for a comparable property. If you don't understand why that rate of return from home equity is always zero, which is shocking for some to realize for the first time, go back and listen to some earlier episodes here. I began discussing that way back in episode six in the year 2014. The fourth of 18 reasons is consider liquidity. Although most homeowners build equity, that equity is difficult to access. So for you to tap your home equity, oftentimes you've got to prove to a bank that you qualify again and maybe wait months and incur loan costs. And then after all that, you might still be denied access to the equity. Houses make terrible banks. Don't store your money there. Instead, renters stay liquid. And if a homeowner makes an extra principal payment to the bank, or really any principal payment at all, and you want to get that money back out, well, the bank is in control of that money. Like I've said elsewhere, you make an extra principal payment to the bank, well, that's just like you saying, hey, Mr. Banker, here's an extra $500 principal payment. Don't pay me any interest on it. If I need it back, I'll pay you fees. And I'll prove to you that I qualify again. That's a bad deal for you. Home equity is illiquid. The fifth point is related to the last one, and that is opportunity cost. A lot of homeowners immediately tie up as much as a 20% down payment in their home. Some of them that aren't very good with their finances tie up even more than that in a down payment. And again, these are illiquid dollars with zero return. And instead, your chunk of money can actually be earning a return for you elsewhere. And conversely, renters, they only tie up a comparably small amount of dollars with their security deposit, way, way, way less than down payment dollars like homeowners do. The sixth consideration is sunk cost. And this is a persistently overlooked killer for homeowners. Homeowners sink money into the property, most of which they'll never get back again. You've got mortgage loan closing costs on your purchase day, constant home maintenance and repairs, property taxes, utilities, uh, landscaping, HOA dues, doing things like replacing pipes and repairing roofs and snow removal and roof maintenance and painting costs. All those things are never fully recouped. Well, renters simply bear fewer of these sunk costs. Next is the seventh consideration in you weighing, should you rent your home or should you own your home? And at the end, I'm going to give you a conclusion here. The seventh is control. For some homeowners, the peace of mind in knowing that a landlord cannot tell you to move with 30 or 90 days notice, that is a priceless feeling that you have, that control as a homeowner. You have an anchor, it is yours, and you can knock out a wall, you can renovate your kitchen, or add a fence. Make it yours. Renters don't have that control. The eighth consideration is appreciation. Renters don't experience price appreciation, and even worse, they might have to weather rent price increases. Homeowners with loans, well, they benefit from financial leverage, and that amplifies your wealth in an appreciating environment. Even though most homeowners don't even understand leverage, in my experience, they are still the beneficiaries of it. Financial leverage, that makes compound interest look slow and boring. Inflation is your friend as a mortgage debtor as it helps you kind of silently pay down your loan balance. And that's something that very few people realize because your principal and interest payment stays fixed for up to 30 years. 
Of course, home values can deflate too, but that's not common. The long-term trend tilts strongly toward home price appreciation. The ninth of 18 factors is tax advantages. Homeowners often get a mortgage interest deduction and perhaps some other advantages like adding solar power cells. Number 10 is mobility. Renting keeps you nimble with a new job opportunity or a life change like marriage and kids. Your mobility is an asset. On the other hand, homeowners eventually sell and then they are beaten up with closing costs and make ready expenses and sales commissions and the sum of those can shave fully 10% off of your sale price. That's pretty common. If you're going to live somewhere less than five to seven years, that tilts toward renting. Longer than five to seven years, that favors owning. The 11th factor is low mortgage rates. Yeah, homeowners can still tie up long-term fixed interest rate debt at historically low rates. Well, what do I mean? Because mortgage rates have been up the past year or two. Well, yeah, they're still below their historic average of about 7.5%. And if mortgage rates go up further, you're going to be glad that you bought. And if mortgage rates go down, like they inevitably will, you can refinance that to a lower mortgage rate if you've got good credit in assets. So if you maintain good credit, therefore what you can do is you can play both sides of that mortgage rate game. The 12th of 18 factors is your rent to price ratio. This is really general, but if a home costs less than about 350k, own it, and if it costs more, then pay rent. If the monthly rent is under about $600 per 100k worth of home, then rent it, and if rent costs more than that, own it. So this is a formulaic approach and it indicates how much home you have the benefit of living in per dollar paid. Again, these numbers are surely fairly general. Regionally, it makes more sense to rent on the U.S. coasts and to own your property in the heartland. And yeah, there are numerous regional exceptions to this rule of thumb. The 13th is community formation. And yeah, this is surely a touchy-feely thing here, but owning your home, that provides you and your neighbors with a feeling of belonging. Homeowners have more interest in looking out for the common good of the neighborhood, and that helps everyone in your community. People feel more fulfilled when they're part of something greater than themselves. So owning your home, that makes you more anchored in a sense of community. The 14th factor is travel. This is so simple, yet everyone overlooks this. Have you been to New York City, Florida, California, Alaska, Hawaii, Greece, Norway, Tanzania? <laughs> you surely can't travel everywhere before you decide where and how you want to live. But if you haven't even gotten out to see a good chunk of the very world that you live in, then how do you know where the best place is for you to live? If you haven't yet traveled much in your life, consider renting until you found that geography, and that place that fits your interests. The 15th is personal cash flow. If it costs substantially more to own a place rather than rent that place, then rent it and vice versa. Homeowners that divert too much of their income into a mortgage payment are what is known as house poor. You might have heard of that condition before, house poor. Being house poor stifles your opportunity to travel and invest and provide opportunity for your family. So don't get trapped into being house poor just because you can stretch to barely afford a mortgage and stretching to afford a mortgage on your own home that can also impair what mortgage loan underwriters call your debt to income ratio. Well, if your debt to income ratio gets dinged, then that's going to hamper your ability for you to buy more income property down the road. And that's how wealth is really generated. The 16th factor is natural disasters. Areas that have frequent earthquakes or hurricanes or forest fires or floods, well, that clearly tilts to the renter's advantage. Even if you're adequately insured as a homeowner, these catastrophes are worse for homeowners. So if you're a renter, have renter's insurance, look into that. But the natural disasters advantage tilts toward renters. The 17th out of 18 factors in the rent versus own decision are consumer advantages. If you own rather than rent, that can give you 
things like higher credit card limits and more favorable insurance rates. The 18th and final factor are pets. Homeowners have the upper hand here. You can build a fence or a pen for your pet, and then some landlords only allow for certain pets. And there they were, the 18 rent versus own considerations. Now let's talk about what this means to you. Consider that your housing payment is often your life's greatest expense. You're going to be making it month after month, year after year. So it's worth thinking this through, being strategic and running some numbers. And when people say something like, oh, buying a home, that was the best investment I ever made. I don't know about that one. Be careful. They usually didn't consider all of the ongoing costs, like those sunk costs that I mentioned earlier. And yeah, there is still a decided stigma with renting. I don't think it's as great as it used to be, but it's still there. But you don't live your life for the Joneses. You live your life for you. So what is the bottom line with what makes the most sense financially, just strictly financially? Well, because higher rent amounts don't rise proportionally with higher home purchase prices, it is often best for you to be a renter. Yeah, be a renter in a high-end home and then go out and buy low-cost income properties that you rent out to others. And yeah, that certainly sounds unusual. But, you know, living an outsized life is not based on doing what is usual and normal. Yes, you're paying rent to a landlord in a high-end home, and then the best investments are typically low-cost homes in the Midwest and South, that you rent out to others. But again, that's strictly in financial terms. But see, there's no one definitive factor in your rent versus own decision because this is where your finances and your feelings intersect with each other. And if your feelings supersedes the numbers, well, then I sure can't tell you that you're wrong about that. But now you better understand some of those real costs. And if you listen to those 18 reasons again, and for your particular scenario, Oh, let's just say, for example, that 10 tilt toward you owning and 10 tend to favor renting. Well, I don't know if that's a good way to score it because you need to weight each of the 18 factors based on what is more important to you. So here's hoping that you found rent versus own considerations that you've never thought about before. Hey, I would like to invite you to join me on something. Join me live tomorrow. This gives you the opportunity to ask questions, if you like, on our car wash live event. Yeah, a car wash can be a remarkably lucrative real estate business. And when you add a franchise model to it and you sell prepaid car wash memberships and you apply technology, these things become money machines. In fact, the Wall Street Journal recently wrote about car washes. They said this, There is no other operation on a one acre site that can do one million to two and a half million dollars in sales and pocket half of that. That is what the Wall Street Journal said. And any business knows that the key is getting regular recurring income cash flow through monthly memberships and selling car wash customers a $30 monthly membership. That means that a rainy week doesn't dent your profits. Technology with a car wash user mobile app and automatic car recognition that keeps the line of cars moving. And this provides the ability to move more than 200 cars an hour through the wash tunnel with just two or three on-site employees. So you've got brushes and scrubbers and air blasters, and they're all programmed to the specifications of the prepaid membership. That's the advantage of the technology. And what I'm talking about here are the innovative operations of the Tommy's Express car wash franchise. And if you take a look at their location map, they really display these flourishing growth plans. And it is now one of the fastest growing franchises in the nation. In fact, Panera Bread and Chick-fil-A are the only franchises with higher sales revenue per location than Tommy's now. Wow. My longtime friend Dave, he has been a regular GRE podcast guest here with us. He is an expert on this model, and countless GRE followers have already invested with him. But I've got to say, I had very little idea about how car washes operated until learning about it from Dave last year. So he's going to join me on this webinar tomorrow, and this interest is really gaining momentum. So 
Tomorrow, Tuesday the 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern, he and I are hosting a car wash live event where you can learn about this lucrative model, you can ask us questions, and if this sounds interesting, you might even have the opportunity to participate as an investor yourself. Register now. It's free at grewebinars.com. You're going to learn some interesting things. And like other real estate, car wash location is vital. It's got to appear convenient to users before they're going to buy that prepaid membership. And a lot like an apartment building, the car wash's value is based on its income stream amount. And income is often double the operating expenses, and some of those car wash expenses include maintenance and electricity and water and detergent. Whether customers own a gas-powered car or an EV or a diesel, it doesn't matter. They'll pay a $30 monthly subscription because all of them need to go through the car wash, all of these car types. And car wash revenue streams are interesting because they don't just have a few deep-pocketed users. Instead, it's a small amount of capital with high volume when you look at all of their users. So that helps keep the income stream steady. And what about recession history? Car washes performed well from 2008 to 2010. So that $30 a month, that simply is not burdensome enough to cancel. Car washes have high cash flow and tax efficiency. Pro forma returns for individual investors like you have a 1.75x ROI within five years and bonus depreciation. The internal rate of return is expected to be 22.8%. And of course, there is always risk with any investment and we'll discuss that. So this is an opportunity for you to add a new diverse passive income stream. Call it car wash cash flow. If you're accredited, you can probably participate. And I learned that zero Tommy's Car Wash Express franchise locations have failed to date and the sponsor dave he doesn't get anything until investors get both return of your principal plus your 1.75x returns just like with residential income property car wash customers are the ones that pay your mortgage and your operating expenses and they provide the cash flow and i learned something else last year with car washes in gas stations the building gets depreciated at the same rate as equipment does, and therefore you can get bonus depreciation on all of it. So if it sounds interesting, join us tomorrow. It is Tuesday the 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern. I hope to see you tomorrow on the live car wash event. If you're a little late for it, you can still register at grewebinars.com after the fact and see the replay, but I'd really love to see you there tomorrow night. That gives you the opportunity to have questions answered and maybe even participate in car wash cash flow. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.